Ah, uh, um, so how much is that? Welcome to the Podcast Editor's Mastermind, the show where we focus on the business side of podcasting. Today, we're going to be talking about something that we've seen come up a few times, rebranding. And we're going to talk specifically about maybe why you might want to rebrand some things around what branding is, and also maybe some considerations. As we get started, I'm Brian Entzminger. You can find me at toptieraudio.com. To my side is... Carrie Caulfield. Eric, you can find me at yayapodcasting.com. And I'm Michelle Avendroth, and you can find me at rothmedia.audio. And she also has the coolest Instagram name I think I've ever seen. What What is it again? At Sparkle Adventures. So if you want to connect with Michelle, at Sparkle Adventures on Instagram. So we're going to talk about branding. Before we do that, though, Carrie, you're using a new piece of equipment today. Do you want to tell us about it? I am using Focusrite's new Vocaster. It's a cute little device, fits perfectly on your desk, super easy to use, plug and play. It's got software that just kind of magically does all the things. So we, well, I have been testing it out for Focusrite, and I believe you have too, Brian. Yeah, I have. You have the the two. I actually have the one, and I've been testing it out as well. Do kind of like the auto gain feature. I find that it sets the level a little bit lower than I might have done myself, but I also understand that they're probably planning headroom for people that don't know how to control the volume of their laughs. So I totally get it. At some point, I'm hoping to put out an actual video before I have to send it back to them. But yeah, it's cool to be able to use a new piece of gear. And it's fun to see a little bit of competition in the space. Specifically, I think this is something that speaks to Focusrite's brand as far as being that accessible piece of equipment that gives you a high quality recording. And I also like that they went with 70 decibels of gain, which for those of you that are super nerdy like me, that's enough to run a seven, an SM7B or pretty much any gain-hungry hem- microphone out there. That's a nice change from some of the interfaces that don't really have all of that. So enough nerding out. We're here to talk today about branding. And part of the reason we brought Michelle on was not only because Daniel's got a voice like a frog today, but because she and Daniel are going through the process of rebranding their business right now. And I'm kind of excited to see what comes of it. But before we get into like all the rebranding stuff, let's just talk, what even is branding? Like, I think that I know, but also let's admit it. I'm kind of an idiot when it comes to this stuff. So what's branding? Branding, it communicates who you are to the world and ideally your target audience. It communicates, you know, the quality of the services you provide. It can communicate what you do, who it's for, how much it costs what the person should expect, the experience of working with you. And it can be as direct as a mission statement. It can be as indirect as how often you post on social media, but it's just the form of communication between you and the world. Yeah. And it's a way for your potential clients or the people you want to work with just to get to know you. It's like how you show up in the world. That all sounds really simple. And for some reason in my brain, branding is like super hard. It's like this thing that you've got to figure out and you've got to toil over it. Is that really the case? It can be complicated because for a lot of people, business owners, or if it's your personal brand, it can make a lot of sense to you what you do and who it's for. But if it's not, I would say done well, or if it's not done with intention or communicated, yeah, if it's not communicated efficiently, there will be a disconnect and you won't be able to find that ideal audience that are a fit for you and the service or offering you're trying to share with others. I feel like a people get really hung up on overthinking it like they do with marketing because it ultimately is communication. It's just how you speak about and present what you do. And Yes, you should do it. Definitely do it with intention, but you can keep it pretty simple. It doesn't have to be overly complicated, right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, and I would say that that's definitely true for our like existing branding. It was stuff that Daniel created when he started the business because it was what he liked. And it has worked for us because we've had Roth Media for over five years and I would say pretty successful. But we're now rebranding in order to kind of tighten it up and um, 
really make it that branding with intention that it hasn't been up until now. But yeah, I mean, just Daniel just picked some colors that he liked and put out a call to some designers for a logo and and that was our branding. So yeah, it can be super simple for sure. Yeah. And I am in the middle too. I know you guys are rebranding, but I'm in the middle too of kind of, of rebranding, I guess. I haven't gotten very far on it, but I'll save it because, you know, I'm just kind of shifting gears a little bit. So, all right, Brian, I'm lost. (laughs) You're not lost. (laughs) My brand, I think, is that I'm the guy that just throws a question into the middle of a room and then waits for people to figure out what to do with it. So uh, that's maybe not your fault. Part of the reason I keep asking these kinds of questions is because a few weeks ago, we had Tara on from Tansy Astor, and she took a look at my website and let me know that there were some holes in my branding. And so those are some things that I want to plug. But I would say that I'm not ready to yet do what I would call a rebrand. And this probably goes to that whole overthinking part in terms of like, I mean, I felt pretty good about what I had. And then she, in about eight seconds, pointed out exactly <laughs> what was missing from my branding. So like, those are some things that I'm trying to not overthink, but also think through really well. How can I make this simple? Like, let's just do therapy for Brian. Assume that there's at least one other person out there that struggles with the same thing. So <laughs> tell me what to do. Well, Brian, who do you want to work with? I would say, so I I don't have a succinct way to say this, but one of the clients that I like working with the most is a business owner who has a small to medium-sized business where training and coaching and that kind of thing is basically his business model. I think that I would like to work with more of him. What color do you think he likes now? (laughs) Um, well, uh, I don't want to give away the name, but his website has a lot of green, but that's also related to the name of the business green and growing and that kind of thing are all related to the name of his business. So that's maybe more a function of the name that he chose than the color that he likes, if that makes sense. Well, so, I mean, just right off the bat. So I would think that you're pretty much not going to be talking to a lot of women and, you're probably not going to be using colors like pink or lavender, or I know this all sounds like kind of gendery, but <laughs> I, um, it does. Yeah. And you're probably not going to use a ton of glitter. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, right off the bat, you can start eliminating how you're going to communicate, like how you're not going to communicate with people, right? You're going to be more male oriented, right? And you're going to be more business oriented. So you're probably not going to wear glitter cat ears. I had my hopes set on the glitter cat ears. Right? <laughs> no, that's, that's fair. So you can see what I'm getting at is you're starting to take things off the table. And I am a big fan of working through things through the process of elimination. Because what is that kind of client not going to be attracted to? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And Andrea has a comment. She likes to think of it in terms of copy and word choice as well as packages. Imagine you're speaking or writing directly to that one client every time you speak or write. And then think about exactly what he needs and the problems you solve for him and sell that. Those are definitely things that I'm thinking about. Thank you for sharing that, Andrea. It's hard for me, and I realize this is probably just a mental block, but it's hard for me sometimes to see that as branding also, but I I realize that it is. I talked a little bit about why I'm thinking about branding is basically because somebody came and looked at my website and said, you don't have one. (laughs) So, I mean, that's not entirely true, but it's kind of a fun thing to say. Michelle, why are you guys, why are you and Daniel thinking about rebranding? Or actually you're doing it. Why are you doing it? So it goes back to the fact that when Daniel started Roth Media, he went with colors that resonated with him. And at the time, his brand was, I'm an editor looking for clients. That was it. But as time has gone on, he has found and and our business has really fallen into the niche of working with women, clients, coaches, and the services that we offer are of a certain quality. And Daniel likes a lot of really kind of rough uh, surfaces or rough textures in the, the things that he creates. So a lot of paint splatters, a lot of brush strokes, a lot of permanent marker fonts. And those are graphics and imagery that wouldn't quite resonate with the audience that we're looking to work with. And this is something that I've been wanting to do for a couple of years since I came on to Roth Media, which is really find new graphics. And I would say when it comes to rebranding, we're really changing the way things look 
but not really. Well, I mean, we are also changing like how active we are on social media, which is part of branding as well, because we want to be seen as like active and helpful, which is something that's communicated with how often you post on social media. So yeah, we are rebranding to make sure that our ideal audience, when they, let's say, because when, when you look for a service, you're going to open up probably like 12 different tabs of companies that in the top Google search results. And we want to be sure that when clients come to our website, they know that we serve them and that it would be a good fit because they resonate with the colors that we use, the fonts that we use, the style of our website, the layout of everything. And so that's why we are rebranding is to better communicate to our ideal clients, who we are, what we do. So you shared the what, right? You're adjusting your colors, you're adjusting your fonts, some of those things. How did you choose? Like, did you just go, I, Daniel likes dark, burnt red. I prefer pink and cat. Like, how did you choose? I am a bit of a designer and I'm pretty active on social media. And I was just looking at, oh, and really too, it was Canva templates that were out there. When I went to look at Canva templates for social media content, and I was putting in like business posts or whatever, I was seeing a lot of like abstract blobs or the templates. There was a certain look I was going for. And then when it came to colors, I went to the psychology of colors. And a lot of clients, particularly coaches, the kind of clients we would be working with, Blue resonates with them. It's calm. It's reassuring. It communicates stability, I believe. And then green indicates money, wealth, income, knowledge, I think is another like psychology of color for green. And then you need like a a nice neutral. So that brought in the tan color that we have in our new branding. You mentioned stalking people, right? You A little bit of research, a little bit of stalking, some of that. Did you use any other resources as you were going through this to help kind of guide you through the process? Like what questions you need to think about? Or are these just things because you're a designer, you you know the questions to ask? Yeah, I think it's just something I know. I mean, I spent a couple of years um, working and really kind of flexing that design muscle. I owned a sticker and stationary planner shop before I joined Roth Media. And so part of what I did with that was learning about colors and finding clients that really resonate with your brand, which was for me back then, glitter and pink and sparkles, as you can tell, if you can see my background. But I, yeah, I learned a lot through that, through just being active on social media and then my design background. Andrea also has the suggestion, look at the websites and social media of your desired clients, make yours in the same family. That's another great stocking suggestion. Carrie, I know that you're going through the process of rebranding as well. Is this something you're comfortable sharing, like what your process is right now? Yeah. So mine is really switching from kind of a company brand to a personal brand. So almost the opposite of what exactly Daniel and Michelle. So they zig, you zag. Is that? The- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also about the, you know, the kind of clients that we're going after. And the kind of work that we're doing. So I have just decided that I am going to show up as me no matter what I try to do. Like, (laughs) I'm not not really a good company person. I am a great me, but I'm not a good company person. So that's why I decided to use a personal brand right? My name and not like Yaya podcasting anymore because I don't, I mean, you guys talk about Roth media all the time. So that really makes sense because, and it's both of you, right? But everything I do, I usually just lead with my name and not my business. So I feel like it makes sense to be more personal and lean into that part of how I show up in the world, that part of me and really just embrace it. Right. And then that attracts the kinds of clients that I'm looking for because, you know, I'm chatty and opinionated. (laughs) Um, You know, I speak up for things and maybe cause a little trouble. You know, who I'm really looking to work with are people who are doing interesting things, who are being more innovative, you know, creative startups and, you know, people who are basically trying to push the envelope in different ways. 
And in order to do that, it's a lot easier to attract them with me than it is from behind a company, if that makes any sense. I think that makes a million percent sense. And I I think it's almost easier that Roth Media, it's not my personal brand. I've gotten really confused with my personal brand because for the longest time, I was a content creator in the crafting and planner space. And that was what my social media was. That was my personal brand was all of that. And then really big into travel. Well, then I stopped using a planner and the world shut down for two years. And I have not been active on social media because I'm just looking at my Instagram like, okay, what do I do? What do I post? Who am I to the world? And it's gotten really confusing. So I I think it's amazing that you're following your personal brand, but I'm just so glad that I'm able to do branding for Roth Media as the company. Because to me, it feels easier to kind of, well, easier, but also I've been questioning recently, like, what is it that I'm passionate about? And what is my new personal brand? What am I interested in? And how that overlaps with Roth Media? Because I think they're different. I guess I'm a little overwhelmed by how confused I am. So I'm really excited that you have found direction in that and and you're leaning into that. That's exciting. And I actually like, I felt the complete opposite. I felt confused with my company brand, right? (laughs) Which just made a lot of sense for me. And then Steve Stewart suggested it last year at uh, Podcast Movement. (laughs) because I don't talk about my business, right? I don't, I mean, I talk about my business, but I talk about it like very personally. And so I think that was his little hint to, you know, encourage me to, to lean into this, to be a little, you know, to lean into that personal brand because sometimes people are surprised. I have like a, this whole other company and I'm also the excitement of just minimizing things and really focusing in on the things that I enjoy doing is really exciting for me too, as well. And I like to blow things up, right? I like, (laughs) and it's also nice that your last name is easier to spell than mine. So you can actually go with a personal brand that people can spell. That's a nice touch. Uh, So is Yaya podcasting, is that going away or are you going to keep the website and just put your face on it? So yeah, all the Yaya is going away. And also because I, (laughs) the stuff in my personal life. I'm kind of, I'm going to dissolve the Yaya LLC and I'm going to relaunch under my own name. And I am going to do the website very simply. I am going to do one, like a, just a landing page. And I'm going to have pretty much a link to all my content. So all my writing, I'm going to house on medium because I don't want to deal with the blog. And I haven't decided what to do with the podcast, but I'm just going to keep it as simple and as clean as possible because I don't want to mess with the website. I just want it to be clear. I want you to get in, get out and then come, you know, if you, if you want more, come hang out with me on social media. Right. And that's it. Or hire me, you know, I'll be your friend for money. Um, (laughs) <laughs> so is, is there any part of this process as you're going through it, Carrie, that's scary or concerning? Uh, so the idea of like taking down my, like doing my website again is really scary and taking all that down and like saving the files because I'm going to basically copy everything from the website and put it in a box, a little digital box. It maybe, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to pull my best blog posts and put those up on medium, but yeah, that part is terrifying. I have been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And then also the building of a new website where it's got to be simple. And I'm not a person who says things in a little bit of words. <laughs> so this is, this is somewhat of a challenge for me. I guess I would say that simple doesn't necessarily have to mean succinct. Well, it's also not easy. No. Right now I'm working through the process of getting really clear on what I'm going to be doing. And that takes some personal work. Right. Which as podcast editors, we have all the mental bandwidth in the world to deal with that internal right. stuff. I've got a t- nothing but free time. Uh- <laughs> How about you, Michelle? Is there any part of this that is a little concerning or scary? Well, the first step, <laughs> which for me was um, creating the new logo. That to me was going to be like the anchor point because once we had that, once we figured out the fonts, once we figured out the colors, then we could create a whole 
like redesign of everything else. But for some reason, I had this awful mental block around it. I knew it was something. Well, and we even at one point thought, okay, are we going to change the name of our company? And then it was like, well, what's that going to be? And then there was this big, scary, not scary, but just this big conversation with no clear answers as to what a new company name would be. And we got stuck at that part of the process for a while. And then we realized, okay, we're just going to stick with Roth Media. It's a great name. It's short. It's to the point. Cool. It's done. Okay. So we're going to stick with Roth Media. Now it was, well, we need a designer. And I absolutely hate (laughs) trying to find a designer because yes, I have a design background, but it pretty much, it's like, I can look at something like an art critic and be like, I like that. Or look at something that's like, I don't like that. But actually creating something from scratch, I hate. I hate doing that, which is why I love that Canva templates is a thing. Um, because I can take some someone else's work and just reformat it and put it up and it's done. And so going through the process of finding a designer and then... So we that wasn't easy, but we found this platform, Hatchwise, where you can submit a brief, essentially. And you'll get so many responses from so many different designers. And I don't remember what the cost was, but so we just, we put the brief out there and then we started getting so many responses that I got like overwhelmed by that. And then I also got overwhelmed by how many ugly (laughs) logos that we got in response that were completely off the mark. And so then I just kind of, like I was getting these emails from Hatchwise saying, you've got a new, you know, submission, whatever, whatever. And I was just ignoring it because I was like, I can't even sift through the uggos And it's just like, it was overwhelming. So it's like every single step of the way has been, there's been like a mental block for me, but it feels like now that we have the logo, it's done, it's completed. um, I feel excited to jump into the next portion. So I would say that getting to this point has been really sticky with like mental blocks, but I'm excited for what's to come. That's really interesting that you, you say that you started with the logo because I did too. And I did like, even when I started Yaya yeah, yeah, podcasting, that's the place I started. So I wonder if that's just kind of the easiest place to start, you know, name and logo. Yeah. I mean, I think that when you're looking at a company and you're thinking about the graphics, I think we do want to just find something tangible and identifiable and be like, this is me. And from there, you can build out everything else. Yeah. I would think that a logo is a great first place. I mean, I say that and then I've been stuck in this, we need a logo. To, uh, portion of our business for like two years now, but it's done. It's done. I think I'd push on that a little bit though. Cause I don't know that you actually started with the logo. I think you started with the brainstorming around who do we serve and what communicates with them and all of the research, right? So yeah, the logo might be the first thing that you had done for you, but you started two years ago on this project, right? And then it's in the last, what, two months that you've been pushing on the logo. That's true. That's actually 100%. I'm glad you said that because um, when I think about it, when I've thought about our new branding, it did start with the research, like you said, with looking on social media, with looking at, um, like it was Andrea who commented and said other clients' websites and seeing what are some trending fonts and styles that they're using that resonate with them and their audiences. And yeah, that's exactly where we started. And then I actually went and built, because I thought the next step was going to be to just start posting new stuff on social media. And then I realized, well, in order to do that, I feel like we need to do a full relaunch, rebrand with new colors, designs, everything else. So then I started building social media templates that I could point to every time that there's like a logo question, it was those templates. So yeah, it started with research, uh, social media, Canva templates, social media, and then um, yeah, the logo. I'm just digesting. That's a lot to think through. I mean, sitting on this side of it going at some point, there may be a rebrand in my future. It certainly sounds overwhelming. Is it overwhelming? I think it's the figuring out, right? It's that who do you want to work with? What do you want to do? doing that research is the hardest part. It really is. So maybe some insight into my personality. When I think about guys who date, I think that there are basically two personalities. You've got the sniper that's looking for that person and you've got the shotgun. They're just like the guy at the bar saying hi to everybody, right? I tend to be the sniper. And so I always want to know that I've got a high probability of success before I start thinking about pulling the trigger figuratively. How do you know that your branding's right? If it feels good to you. You just feel it in your bones, Brian. I don't know what else to tell you. If it feels authentic (laughs) to you, 
and it makes sense, go for it. Because even if it's not communicated well or it's not perfected branding that you would get from a, a marketing firm or something that someone created for you, if it feels something that you're passionate about and you're ready to go with your artwork, colors, branding, website, whatever it may be, I think you're ready. Because And you can always clean it up as you go, as we tell our podcasting clients. You can always put new artwork up, uh, like for a show. You can always change your intro. You can always change your fonts, your colors. But I would just say, because I've been stuck in overwhelm, it can, you can, it can feel overwhelming, but keep going. <laughs> I know it's not an answer you no. like, but it is. But But how did you know, like, I don't know. It's like any other kind of decision-making process or big... I mean, certainly don't let it keep you from doing anything, right? You know, but just pay attention. Be aware of how you're communicating, what's working, what's not working for you right now. And then start... And again, this is why I love process of elimination because I can very much, easy, you know, figure out what I don't like and what's not working faster than I can figure out what's working and what I like. Cool. That's That's helpful. I'm kind of running out of questions because you guys are so good at answering them. One thing I am wondering, as you think about Michelle, you and Daniel are kind of going through this together and you had somebody do your design. Did you have anybody else acting as a consultant while you were going along the, along the path? Yeah, we were working with a business coach uh, in 2020 and 2021. And she was helping us go through the steps of identifying the parts of that research process. Who is it we're targeting? What are their interests? And she helped us create that customer profile that we wanted to target with our branding. And she was a really great sounding board for ideas. And she was the one that was like, well, do you guys want to change the name of your company? And it, and it was a good question that we had thought about. Um, so that was kind of, kind of nice to have was that bit of sounding board. Um, and I want to shout out her, well, just in the way that her branding for her consulting company was totally not what I would recommend to a client. It was a, a Welsh word, I think, that it doesn't mean anything to anyone else. But what was so cool about her particular branding was how passionate she was about it. She was targeting women, yet she was using red and black and a dragon and a Welsh word was the name of her company. If a client came to me and said they were targeting women, I wouldn't have recommended any of those things at all. But what was so cool was, you know, in conversations that she would have with us about identifying what resonates with us and our clients, she identified that she was like, I know that women probably won't like dragons, the, the kind of women that I would want to work with. But I feel so passionate about it being, you know, I love dragons and I love this word and I love these things. So I think that that was a really cool example of it doesn't always have to be something that's inauthentic to you in service of your ideal client. It can be just something that you're passionate about. I like that. And I started specifically, like, I'm not a huge, <laughs> for my colors, For certainly for Yaya podcasting, I am not a huge, like, lavender person. So that was completely led by what I thought my clients or my ideal client would like. And I don't hate it, but, like, none of it was just what I wanted, right? It wasn't what I wanted. It was just how things kind of came together. And it it wasn't perfect. It wasn't like, I didn't like love it, love it, but it worked. And I, coming from kind of a scrapbooking world, always loved handwritten fonts. So I actually got somebody to do a handwritten font for me for this new personal brand, because that's that's what I wanted. Cool. So is it like one of those signature things where it looks all like refined and super wealthy? And it just kind of looks more like a signature thing. I wouldn't say it looks super wealthy. It was, and actually it's funny because it's one of those Facebook, it's a Facebook ad. Oh, it was I like, love those. Your, yeah. And I did it. And I don't know that I will stick with that forever, but it was easy enough to take action on in the moment and close enough to what I had envisioned that it worked. Yeah, I think that that's great too, because in working through our logo, I don't, we have a script font in part of it and I actually don't like it. I, well, I like it, but I don't love it. 
But it was just like, I just needed to have, have a decision and be done with it because we had gotten stuck on this point for so long. And it's like, I really don't want to sit here and go back and forth, back and forth with the designer to get it like exact. It's just like, we just need to close the book on this and move on. If you're stuck on something, I would say, give yourself permission to just make a decision and move on. It doesn't have to be perfect. Yep. Pick it and stick it. What if I'm stuck at the starting line? <laughs> close the book on it, move on, pick up another project. You're, you're good. Yeah. Just keep moving. Yeah. yeah I like it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's okay. Like not to rebrand and just hold off. I mean, Michelle and Daniel have been doing this for two years. I have been doing this, like thinking about this for a year and we're both still in the process or we're all still in the process of doing this. It, it really is kind of a journey for sure. Yeah. And you know, as you say that, it kind of reminds me of the, the same advice that we would give a podcaster if on every episode they're trying to rethink their intro, right? We'd be like, well, give it a couple months and then do it, right? Stop focusing on the the stupid stuff he says to himself as he scratches his shoulder. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that, that's good. Um, one of the things that Daniel had popped in the the private chat that we have is you you mentioned Michelle a mission statement and that in some ways maybe a mission statement could actually be your brand. Like, is it important to even have a mission statement? What's the deal with that? It's really important. And it's something that we need to, we have one. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. Uh, it's something that we need to refine. I recently did a session at PodFest and um, it was about SEO for your website. And I reached out to the podcasting community to get um, some examples of other websites I could use in my presentation. And as I started looking at podcasters' websites, I realized that something that I feel like good websites had was essentially a form of their mission statement right at the top of their website, which explained who they are and what they do. So there was one example that was like diversity, equity, inclusion, and then a subheading like education, resources, coaching. And that was a form of their mission statement that made it very clear what they did and who it was for. Whereas another podcaster, they didn't have any sort of, it was, I think, just like a generic stock photo of a forest was their background. And if you were someone who was searching for resources or coaching or consultation for DEI work, you wouldn't know the the website that didn't have the mission statement very clearly shown on their site, you know, what they even did, and you would probably click off pretty quickly. So yeah, I would say that a mission statement is very important, not only to communicate, but also for yourself, that you can summarize in two sentences who you are, what you do, and like what kind of service you're providing. And that, you can use that on your website. You can use that in your podcast. You can use that as your bio for a presentation or a podcast guesting position, you know, experience. Um, yeah, I think a mission statement is very, very important. And it's like that elevator pitch, right? That you would tell a podcaster to have, right? Give me one sentence really quickly about your show, what it is, who's it for, right? All the important information. And I, I think that really, really is something that podcast editors need as well, because you're going to find yourself as a podcast editor, or we're all going to find ourselves in situations where we're standing in front of a potential client and they really want us to very clearly, very concisely share what we do with them. Right. And the better you do that, the better you're able to communicate. Not only do you gain a potential client, but then they can go tell their podcast or friends, Hey, I met Brian. And he does this amazing stuff with podcast editing. He can literally transfer your mission statement to another person. That helps you get more word of mouth referrals. Definitely. We just, uh, I had a conversation with a consulting client two weeks ago and she's already started her podcast. And so we get on the call. This is our first call. I was like, okay, so what is your show? What do you do? And she said, we're a podcast for women. Whereas if she had a mission statement, it would be, I have a podcast sharing conversations about important moments in a woman's life in order to help her move through those experiences of trauma and come out on the other side feeling empowered. Like that, I feel like is more of a version of a mission statement instead of I'm a podcast for women because a podcast for women tells us very, very little. I wouldn't say nothing, but it would tell us very little. Whereas 
a mission statement clearly communicates what it's for, what we experience when we listen to our podcast and motivates. It it provides that motivating factor to press play. That kind of reminds me of, um, oh, I don't remember the guy's name now. He makes shows for NPR or something. He's got like a 10 word show premise or something like that. It's like you have to be able to express the premise and the audience of your show in 10 words or less. And they can't be any of the words that you would find in normal marketing materials and in a way that's totally unique. It sounds like that's kind of what you're doing there. It's making it something that describes my business and only my business or my show and only my show. Is that? Yeah. And somehow also, I think it's important to communicate the values of your brand and your show. I think a mission statement can be a couple different things. Well, it it's usually so... Um, you'll have a mission statement. You can have a vision statement, which is like once you've completed the mission, what's you know what's the end goal, right? What what is the vision for the better world you're creating? And then your values. You can have a value statement, a separate value statement. And I think having all three is really good and is going to really help you be more intentional intentional with your branding and how you show up in the world. And that's going to attract people to you. I mean, the right people. Hopefully, if once I finally get this <laughs> dialed in, I won't have an 80% bounce rate on my website because it will immediately communicate to all the people that I'm the right person for them, no matter who they are. Well, okay. I would, ar- I would argue that it also, in the, the opposite tone, helps you disqualify people really quickly. Right. Because all the bad people are going to be the ones bouncing away. So if you have an 80 percent bounce rate, that means the 20 percent are staying. Right. And are your people. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I don't know anything really about bounce rates. But okay, I mean, I made yeah. up the stat. I'm not sure what my bounce rate is right now. Um, anything else we need to talk about rebranding before we move on to the mailbag? No, I don't think so. Just don't be afraid to. Switch gears when you need to. I mean, that should be the quote of the day, right? Don't be afraid to switch gears when you need to. (laughs) And it doesn't have to be perfect in order to be done. Because right now, you know, we're in the middle of like, well, how do we launch this thing and how do we do it? And it's just like, there's a million different ways, but just go with what feels authentic to you and on a timeline that works for you. And it doesn't have to be perfect to be done. And I guess my bit of wisdom would be listen to these two. And if you start to feel bogged down, just remember you're probably doing better than I am. So... (laughs) Keep going. Uh, Moving on to the mailbag. This is something that we started last time. Uh, We're trying to bring some of the questions that we have that come into us that maybe we can't make a full episode out of. We want to bring them up and try to address them as part of another episode. This was one that actually came in from Curtis and Chris, and it's a remarkably common topic within the podcast editing space. And that's really around how do I find clients? And I think this ties in really well with what we've been talking about today in terms of branding. Carrie or Michelle, who wants to talk about this first? Here's where I think that people tend to overcomplicate branding. And that's in not understanding that branding is just how you communicate with potential clients, right? And if you don't have any kind of branding and you're kind of all over the place, you're probably going to struggle attracting clients to you because nobody wants to deal with the hot mess. <laughs> it's horrible to say. Branding helps you be really together and present yourself in a more professional way, I think. And I and it doesn't matter where you are, you're on social media, you're in person at, you know, a dinner party, if you're at Podfest, how you show up is really important. And I think that if you want to find clients, you really need to consider how you're showing up and what that branding is, what that communication is for you and be really intentional about it. In addition to that, it's how you show up with your existing clients too. If you're providing quality, if you're building relationships with your existing clients, Hopefully, you're also building in longevity there, and they'll share you by word of mouth to other people that they may know in their networks. Um, but if you're missing deadlines, if you know you're not communicating well, if you're not building relationships, let's say you know a client you're working with is at a dinner party and someone else is looking to start a podcast, 
they might not recommend you, but they will if you've provided quality service to them, which is part of your offerings and your service and, and tells part of your brand story, is someone who's reliable, consistent, fun to work with, um, helpful. Those are also part of a brand that would inspire and encourage someone to share you to others. I think the thing that I would share, and this is something that I'm continuing to try to do better, is to aspire to work with the people that you would want to hang out with, maybe not be best friends with, but people that you would actually want to spend time with and people where if you were to be with them in a group of people, you might feel like the plus one, but you don't feel completely out of place. So that if you were to hop into a Facebook group and interact with them, you're, you're not like a fish out of water. So if I were to go and hop into Just Busters on so many levels, I would not be the right person for that. And I get that. Like, that's totally fine. And it's not that I wouldn't want to work with them, but that's not a place where I would be welcome. And that's okay. But there are places where I am welcome, even though I don't necessarily fit the exact mold of the people that hang out there. And I think finding those places of overlap and putting yourself out there, which for me is certainly difficult. But yeah, Andrea also has a great comment. A lot of her clients are referrals from her personal network. Even though her friends don't need an editor, their companies or their friends' businesses do. Certainly a, an excellent reminder as well. Oh, I'm just going to say that if you are stuck on branding, have a talk with your friends because how you communicate what you do to them, they can bounce that back to you and give you ideas and what they feel you do really well at communicating and what you don't. Yeah. And they'll point out where there may be a disconnect in your messaging. They'll, they'll be like, wait, who? Or wait, what? What is, what is this? They'll be the person to actually ask questions and response if they're confused. Whereas if you post in a Facebook group and being like, hey, looking for feedback, strangers might not be invested enough to ask <laughs> yes. questions. Um, <laughs> but people in your personal network, your friends will. We also will give you feedback as well if you post in the podcast editor's mastermind Facebook group because we are total nerds. <laughs> we're, we're glad to do that. I would like to remind you though that if we're not your target audience, we're glad to provide that feedback, but just keep in mind that your ideal client might have a better take on it than we do. And then I just want to bring up one more thing that Andrea said. Why don't we just have Andrea on? I know. Andrea said she to, you know, for clients, she does free speaking events in her community. I think that podcast editors do need to kind of be out in public doing things. Um, and I know people may not necessarily feel comfortable doing that, but it really does work because, you know, oh, I saw you at, right? Or you did, I heard you on this podcast or, I saw you speaking here or there, and there's a lot of outreach you can do in, in your within your local community that will make you the person in your community for podcasting. Are we ready for the Poddex question of the day? Unfortunately, my Poddex are all the way over there because when I unpacked from Podfest, I stuck them in the wrong spot. So I'm using the app today, but I really do have a Poddex question of the day, and it's one that I don't have an answer for. Would you rather go 30 days without your phone? or your entire life without dessert? This is a really hard question. Brian. I know. That's why I said I don't have an answer yet. <laughs> now, is it all sweets or is it just the, the specific dessert that's after a meal? Like the sweet thing that comes after a meal? I mean, I feel like if you have dessert instead of salad, it doesn't necessarily constitute not dessert. Like we could maybe make a case that a Snickers bar is not the same as your grandma's apple pie. But if you do grandma's apple pie instead of salad, I'm sorry. You might have to kill that dessert. <laughs> I think I would rather give up. Yeah, I think I would rather, rather give up dessert. I'm not really, I don't have a big sweet tooth when it comes to sweet or savory. I'm 99% of the time going savory. So it's not a big loss for me. And losing that connectivity to others would greatly, I think, negatively impact my life if I had to give up my phone. I still have my laptop though, right? I mean, it wasn't in the question. So I guess... Since you're creating your own universe here, Carrie, you can do what you want. <laughs> wow, this is really hard. Um, I struggle with this one. Can I just alternate six months, no phone, six months, dessert? Like, it's cool. Dessert. So if, if we think about the, uh, 
what is it like the five stages of grief? I think we went from denial to bargaining here. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what's next, but Carrie's about to take my head off. I think <laughs> anger is one of them. Yeah, this is a great insight. Yeah, into I don't your like this one. <laughs> All right, before I give mine, we do have a couple questions or answers from the chat. Daniel says 30 days without his phone. That's easy. Andrea says phone and then also says that ice cream is joy. I can't necessarily disagree with her on that. Honestly, I would probably choose dessert. And it's not because I don't want dessert, but because I've been spending the last two months trying to undo two years of staying at home and eating dessert. And it kind (laughs) of sucks. So if I had to choose one, (laughs) man, if I don't have dessert, then I'll live longer. I don't know. It's a tough call. I think I would choose dessert, but primarily because that would just help me to go the direction I should probably go for the most part anyway. Uh, I guess we'll have to get to acceptance and I'll say dessert because I have diabetes. Uh, <laughs> probably the better choice <laughs> is to give up dessert. Well, All right. That's great. Well, if, if you stuck with us long, you are definitely a hardcore viewer or listener, depending on whether you caught the live stream or you're listening later. And we would love to hear from you. If you didn't already answer, just let us know. What would you choose? No dessert or no phone. And it's 30 days of the rest of your life, which clearly one of them is outweighing my life. If you want to let us know, just head over to uh, podcasteditorsmastermind.com and shoot us a note through the form there or tag us somewhere on Facebook or Instagram and let us know what you would choose because we'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to be a guest, Carrie, can you tell us uh, what do people need to do to be a guest? Um, You can go to podcasteditorsmastermind.com slash be a guest. Fill out the form and it will go to our mailbox where Daniel will hopefully check it and get back to you. Excellent. Thank you, Carrie. And with that, I think we're going to draw it to a close. I'm Brian Itzminger. You can find me at toptieraudio.com. Links to all of my social stuff is there. Below me is... I'm Michelle Avendreth. You can find me at rothmedia.audio. I'm Carrie Caulfield. Eric, you can find me at Carrie Eric on Instagram and for just a little bit longer at yayapodcasting.com. <laughs> and in the chat today was Daniel Abendroth. You can find him at rothmedia.audio. He was the Yeti of the chat and a very integral part of our team today. So Daniel, thanks for taking the hit and doing that for us. Uh, I think that's everything. Anything else we need to do? No, nope. play us off, Brian. All right. Yeah. Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah, bye. <laughs> Uh, um, so how much is that? Um, 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 um